Genealogy Club by Faith Jones O oh, wondrous Caliban, glowing with virtues, you have grown mighty indeed, circling your coordinated flurry of successes. Ours, the renewing round of twenty-four races, all there to be won, and filling them, there's you. So much talk about you, but I sense you are washing up the attributes of a god shrunken to a mere man. Should I relate your montage of pride, or some of the more seedy conquests? Should I expose you before you inevitably reveal yourself? Temerity is more your natural vessel than mine, but you have become interesting enough for the narrator to seep through the fourth wall and pick on you. Look at you tonight, all great men turn into parodies of themselves, and you have proven to be no different. Galleries upon galleries of images lie out there, photo archives of those gala awards, entire scripts tapped out only to lure you into them, the lyrics of a song or two sung and then slapped straight back loud in your face, across red carpets that could once have been. What? Moorish tents stamped down by a celebrated stallion. The ruddied pavilions of empires lost. Fallen to you, then forgiven and cherished. Their hearts and minds stolen with an approachable wave. Too fanciful a simile. Too far east, you're thinking? After all I have witnessed. Don't tell me you've become jaded and prosaic when I have not. Can you blame the narrator for dwelling on style when you make such a hero of it? You do often wear the loose-flowing fashion of the Medes and Phoenicians in videos. But yes, I can see you have no genuine desire to discover the bones of your unlettered ancestors. Crowds and fans, nothing new to you. One who encourages sycophants and idolaters. Do you have a home beyond these transient hotel rooms? Oil paint tubes from where you ordered the lot but forgot to learn. Always meant to. Time soaked into media headlines and out again to do chat shows. And then another broom is out again sweeping mushroom corks off the polish of a parquet floor. The dancing house in Prague is your backdrop. All jazz by Henri Matisse. It's all you. Another time. Another place. No real reason. The components of jazz pull apart in your mind like acid. The piano keys, the sodium door light piercing the nightshade of an alley, leaving only the dancing, posing, tissue paper thin figure of yourself, the centre of attention even when the musicians have gone. One trick you learned early, thank God, the artist, was to always draw the eyes first. A brush with excess paint flicks and falls into an oblong of blackness as one great artist expires and a new generation hatches out from that tired soul's husk to continue the cycle of rebirth and reimagining. So there you both sprawl, dissolved in luxury, the slimmest of legs on a jacket, a gig, the after-party with its candy shop of such daring choices, where you selected by shape, but couldn't see into this girl's mind. Hello, angel, you ventured, with a practised smile. There are two kinds of angel, Aiden. You didn't see the other woman in the room, who instantly coalesced in hatred of her as they faded out of your existence. Your fingers into this one's hair. So adorable. So demure. I think Aiden has an ache. She's into you, but aware of them. The others you've just insulted. Let's split, you say. Okay, shall we go for a coffee? Never coffee after a gig, love. I always have this strange compulsion to get the space hoppers out. Are you staying here? She asks. Wow, that was easy. You love her look of nervous innocence, which says, I wouldn't normally be doing this, but as you're so famous, as I hope you might be my boyfriend, um, I suppose we could do something. Aiden, she knows what she's doing. If you must bless your weary fortune with a vigorous conclusion, we have expectations too. 
I know you're tired, Aiden, but don't dream. This pretty girl has come a long way to suck up and down your personal area of interest. Theodora, let greatness own her, for she is mean no more. What do you think a young woman can possibly get out of this act of submission, especially if her prince nods off and flees along the fields of his pride? That's better. You're rising to meet her. A view of that youthful face in the light. Sensation awakens into electric frisson. The feel of exhilaration under lengthening strokes. An owl flash of eyes as she looks up into yours. And, oops, it's soon over, pulsed into a mop of silky soft hair. That's what you wanted, Aiden. That's what you needed. That's why you act and dance and sing. It's never been about the money or the houses, has it? Now you can rest, thankful boy, and those loving green eyes of yours are closing. She looks around, alone, hesitant, and she's taken it. There's no mess, and you're too far gone to remember when she rolled that sheath along you. Word gets around, doesn't it, that your line of work goes hand in hand with nasty diseases. So perhaps there was some rudimentary intelligence at work after all in this cutie. College girl, is she? You forgot to ask. You've used her and are yet to discover she's really used you. You'd never guess there was no spermicide in that carefully commissioned sample collection system. A pen light comes on, illuminating a strewn path to the bathroom. Then it winks off again. The door from the bedroom opens, the black oblong from jazz again, and into the oblong in essence revealed by distant streetlights steps through your nocturne girl. The crisscross wood of a Japanese screen casts fishnet shadows down her legs, but she's part of your history now, your fault your consequences. She won't switch the main light on, no. Things might get strange and difficult if you were to wake up now. She closes the door silently, opens the clip bag she brought with her, and withdraws a plastic test tube with a hinged lid. Upending her little bag of latex, she pours, squeezing the precious last droplets between fingers, and the tube is soon filled as the lid clicks decisively shut. Blue fluid from a reservoir hidden in the lid sinks into the sample. At the basin now, she turns the tap to cover any sound this makes and shakes the test tube for five seconds, counting in her mind. Checking again to see if you're sleeping, she takes out from the carry bag what looks like an old-fashioned brick telephone. But it isn't. Plastic arms and legs are extracted and locked into position, but again, they are not what they seem. Oh, I get it. Small propellers and a drone is unfolding. In the centre of the flying, whirling device is a hollow shaft like a coffee cup holder, but narrow and deep, into which she slides the test tube. Ravens and their twigs. In a last act of betrayal, Nocturne Girl opens the bathroom window, leans beyond, switches on the drone motor to give it life and lets it go, buoyant now as the cargo of your DNA floats away and down into a fluorescent tangle that spoils true darkness. A stranger's thumb takes and drives it onward now. Sorry, Aiden, she's delightful, but you've been had. Don't take all night, I'm getting cold in here, you call out to her. Unforeseen this, her heart responds and jogs around the ribs in realisation. Not the final act, then, to clear the massive debt from her brother's treatment. He's called Angelo, by the way, but you weren't to know. She silences the running tap and pauses to control her breathing, retouches the lipstick in seconds, and then walks back through the door to the bedroom to play another set in bed, motives and suspicions slipping into infinite blackness behind her. Flip a record on, babe. Okay but someone else's. She's not your fan, neither wish I to be your spiritual amanuensis, as, believe it or not, I'm even more fickle than you are. 
I choose instead, right here and now, to find a soul who seeks their laurels instead of sitting on them, who fears their imperfections and doesn't huff their future up their nose. I bid you a tissue. The next day a functional war clock unwinds to half past seven and an impenetrable girl restored to her elements of virtue and daylight receives a text. Hey, it's Aiden. Let me paint you. You're doing art college or something, right? Paint you in the dark? Yeah, that's totally a challenge. She doesn't reply. Not to him. Already she's someone else he would never recognise. A young professional writing a city parking strategy report at the office. A city at daybreak, on another seaboard, with curtains drawn and streets still quiet, the incessant hum of a cycle courier scatters fat pigeons from topiary tubs as this rattling intrusion banks a corner, a curb, to park outside a modern building, almost blocking the entrance. Reception is open, strangely for daybreak. The cycle courier approaches the desk and is then intercepted, relieved of the sought-after pouch. You can't take the bag as well, chips the courier, and sign a small packet, two fingers lifting, the contents removed, and the bag handed back to him. The sound of a lift and a life descending, almost Faustian this. The doors of the chamber tug open, and, before the guard can step over the boundary, a poised technician in turn relieves the hand of its burden. The guard doesn't bother getting out, settling instead for the return journey and a saving on shoe leather. Bloody lab nerds! At last, this is a real laboratory, a business investment. Is it daytime? Who can tell in these underground spaces, no clock without any signal, where you're not allowed to wear jewellery, trinkets or watches because of potential contamination? A clean room does not always translate to a clean business. Aidan Grange. The tube is marked with a permanent felt-tip marker, like a pair of his old school shoes. It would take you a week to review all of these blinking, plastic-visored facilities, the pins and needles in the intricate process of genetic extraction and sequencing. Stripped of all pair-bonding baggage, no warmth or scent to the nest, DNA strands alone are being loaded apologetically into bleak containers. He'll soon be a multiple-format product, our hapless rock star. Business staff stand around on the far side of a glass panel, waiting for the technicians to finish, and now they have, securing workstations and putting plastic gowns in their lockers. Hello, are you Brendan Chase? A new blue suit, asks a technician. I want to go over the process with you. The technician looks bemused at the face, at the type-in. It should all be in your predecessor's notes. My predecessor was dismissed on the spot and wasn't being entirely cooperative. Referred me to the gagging order in her contract, so I'm having to write procedure notes from scratch. The CEO said he couldn't put anything into writing for operational reasons, so I should come down here and talk to you. Could you give me a break? It's simple, like all good business plans. The elevator on the west side of the building opens at floors 1, 3, 4, and 5. The elevator on the east side of the building opens at floors minus 1 and 2. I'm asking for the process, not the architecture. I'll get to that. Floor 5 is the management level. Floor 4 is marketing and distribution of all the test kits to customers. 3 and 1 are the labs that process the public DNA samples. 2 is where we securely archive the reporting data. And minus 1 is here. I don't get minus 1. It shouldn't be me explaining this, but if no one wants to take the responsibility, I suppose I have to. Put it like this. How many other DNA testing companies offer their services to the public? for either full mtDNA sequencing, deep ancestry, disease markers, or genealogy. The suit counts on his fingers. 23 and Me, Ancestry DNA, Heritage DNA, African DNA, FT DNA, Argus Biosciences, My Heritage, Cambridge DNA Services, BioResolve, Britain's DNA, Family Tree DNA, Ethno Ancestry, five or six more I've forgotten. Too many, so they're undercutting each other. That tosh is only what we do in our core business. Process kits that tell little Sally on her 10th birthday she's distantly related to some sparkly princesses. But to come out ahead in a saturated market, you need to have an angle. Brendan pauses, seeing whether the suit needs him to clarify further. It seems he does. So the tech 
Soldiers on. In this lab, we have compartment two of the business. We curate a collection of what you might term A-list genetic samples, with which we provide reproduction options to discerning and wealthy clients. You clone famous people? No, that would be illegal. We provide ideal silent partner genetics for you to make your child. Designer babies? And that's one way of describing it. Clients can select a remarkable archiver to contribute chromosomes to the child they've always wanted. The genetics they choose are totally unrestricted by compatibility. Male, female, any sexual orientation. We can use real sperm in a few cases for a standard or surrogate pregnancy. Otherwise, we can implant cellular DNA from both parents into voided eggs in vitro and then set the fertilized eggs either in the client's womb or source a surrogate carrier to take it to term, depending on negotiating a solid financial package. Jesus Christ? Einstein? We don't have either of those assets, I regret to say, as they would be somewhat marketable. But we do have many others of significance banked. The genomes of people who achieved their status from 1980 to 2005 are currently sought after because those able to afford this service at the current point in time often began their careers or businesses in those years. Some have underlying fertility concerns, but many are just unattractive superfans with too much money. Which means there's guaranteed ongoing demand for this? Clearly, here's what's happening. If you want my opinion, as long as anyone can remember, the most successful actors and singers have flirted with the audience, openly prostituting themselves in many cases, but the audience couldn't touch, so were driven crazy by it. The stars didn't know or care about who they were seducing at the time, but now the barrier between the intoxicated nutjob fan with unfinished business and the star is breaking down. The new era is here, where a performer in a pretend way openly inviting the viewers to have sex with them will find that there are real consequences, as the wealthy obsessed fan can make good on those promises and have their baby. Is that ethical? It's screwed up, but everything is allowed until there's a law stopping you from doing it. If that happens, it still isn't the end. We take the whole business into international waters, where there's no national jurisdiction, and carry on. What about this sample? The film actor-singer, Aidan Grange. Two options for reproduction, this being a live sample of the right kind of cells. The right kind? Freshly donated from the swaggering poser's bollocks and worth about 7.5 million an ounce. Struth, did we pay Grange? I expect he got something nice out of it. This material can be inserted almost naturally by pipetting into the mother's egg, but that option is still priced as premium because we would run out of stock. Better still, we've sequenced his code, so can build copies of genetic material to insert into a void egg template whenever we need them. You can do that? Build real DNA from only a data sequence? We can do that. Take some responsibility, mate. You're a manager. I only work here. But a string is millions of base pairs long. I didn't say it was shape. When I think of the financial opportunities here, reinsertion from data alone, though, the reconstruction of a man's DNA from a sequence plan, that is something new. When this technology becomes normal, eggs will jump at the chance. He realizes that sounds a little weird. It's not just men's genomes that I'm talking about. We're working on homogametic fertilization in addition to heterogametic. So we might soon be able to help women to conceive with their preferred women and men to do the same, using a surrogate to take that to term. Only a small part of the material has been destroyed in sequencing. The creation of an identical code which spells Aiden's biology exactly in every sense except the corporeal. The technician walks a glass vial to a refrigeration tray marked strictly confidential, subdivided into intelligence, luminaries, and entertainers. The sample grange is archived amongst other tubes with scribbled surfaces that read Adams, Anthony, Arquette, R, Attenborough, Baldwin, Bardo, Berry, Bowie, Chase, Sicconi, Cleese, Clooney, Connery, Cruz, DiCaprio, Eklund, Ford, Hamill, Hathaway, Murray, Presley, Fines, Freud, Feynman, Hill, Hutchins, Jagger, Jobs, Kasparov, Kennedy, Khan, Knightley, Mandela, Marley, Minogue, Musk, Navratilova, Penrose, Perelman, Pfeiffer, Pratchett, Ryder, Sinatra, Smith, Spielberg, Stone and Parker, unfortunately mixed due to circumstances of sample collection, and Windsor, Williams, Woods, and some presumably cheaper social influencers that only kids and the Chinese state's internet monitoring crews have ever heard of. How do you collect these samples? People chuck away their skin and fluids all the time without thinking about it. 
We buy used spoons and cups from restaurants, then swap them for saliva. Take sanitary products from communal waste, hair follicles from hotel pillows, and occasionally use prophylactic. Hotels are worth their weight in gold for genomic collection. Donors won't give their genetics to everyone who has, so you'll see some high consultancy fees every now and then to reward our most talented field agents. How many of the donors know this business exists? The genetics are no longer their property, as they've put them in the communal waste. In rare cases, we do hold some small quantities of viable sperm like granges for clients who want a natural conception and can't pay a premium rate. What surprised me is some famous stars make an effort to find us and be sure that we have their deposit. Bowie, for example. Fuck. We've made that part of the process redundant. Helsinki. An email arrives on a corporate laptop, squared up at the regulation height for ergonomic working, open and ready for business, on a hotel suite desk. The lone occupant, Miss Georgia Farrow, CBE, has dedicated her life to the business her parents started in the 1970s, and one that did well from the original free labor of a hippie community. But it was only under her control that it divested its shoeless friendships, and assembled the corporate tonnage it wielded today. An accountant might tell you Farrow's journey had been close to flawless, but sometimes when you focus too hard on reaching the summit of your mountain, you see other mountains and a much bigger picture emerges, a cohesion of awareness about all the other things in life you could have done instead. Priorities. She'd achieved them for the firm. That was undeniable. But it had all happened at the expense of everything personal, every human need. She'd never allowed herself rewards, personal luxuries, the accoutrement of greed as she considered them anathema to a lifetime's work ethic. She'd never allowed herself pets or cars or men. Opening and reading the message, Miss Farrow feels a knot forming in her stomach and knows at last that she can have something just for herself. She becomes aware of a new sensation in her body. Excitement? Is it joy? She feels the chakras opening and the body telling her what it wants, overruling the logical mind. Heavens, she realizes, she can make a baby with her secret crush, Aidan Grange. Farrow needs to calm down and get control over anything impulsive, so moves over to a tea tray loaded with sachets and makes herself a steady, instant hot chocolate, the first in thirty years, and mulls over whether to entrust her egg after lab fertilization to a surrogate mother or to carry it herself and take it a sabbatical. After all, they promised it could be done, either way. It is a huge investment, she knows, but rationalizes that not only has she earned the right to treat herself to the best, but in the unlikely event that her business did go bankrupt, a natural birth and simple paternity check would ensure Aidan paid serious maintenance money as the father. Was she ruthless enough to do that to him? Well, to anyone else, but... Mm. She never made quick decisions in the past, and wouldn't do that now, returning instead to the technology running her fingers along a music station, awakening to the sensation and tingle of something that had been dormant since her twenties, had she subliminated motherhood. She finds herself unable to decide what to do, not about pregnancy, but whether to play one of Aidan's songs or watch either of his magnificent films. No, the documentary. It makes him more real, domestic, and close enough to touch. Farrow wiggles under the duvet like she's a teenager, and won't sleep tonight for dreaming that Aidan feels the same about her. By midnight she's decided, and is even now, transferring currency. The genealogy club in the long hot summer at Lentwetter's Social Club and Library was somewhere you ended up in Trentsville when you'd reached school leaving age but still weren't allowed to buy drink for a good half a lifetime more. Time passes slowly in this situation, sage rush slow. Charlie, the club volunteer and amateur student of the comedic tradition, was acutely aware of the dust that accumulated in his own throat by seven each evening, and had also seen the effects of tainted homebrew on local people who didn't have enough distraction in their lives. It was time to distribute the testing kits. Now, everyone read the instructions carefully, then I'll go through them on the board. Were they listening? He supposed so, but their attention might soon be on the drift. If you get this wrong, the others will have their results two whole weeks ahead of you. Patua was listening intently. 
Not every male in their twenties would be interested in genealogy and its utility for proving legal relationships, except the few who would discover the power of that particular science at the wrong end of paternity cases. But Patua, who changed his name from John, his mother had chosen to Americanize him, but when he'd moved north he found it was slang for the lavatory, so reverting to a Hopi name meant no surprises. Had something he wanted to prove, with evidence, not long interruptions. When the Hopi lands were designated under the ownership of the native community, the people who lived there were ascribed a level of autonomy by which they could set different rules than the regulations which applied to the land surrounding them. This suited the Hopi fine, as they maintained a special and sometimes spiritual relationship to certain wild vegetable crops, but it was only with the advent of tax-free gambling that they found their modern niche. Hopi casinos became big business in just a few years, and have made their owners wealthy, but to qualify as an owner with a community share of the casino, you had to meet one exceptional qualification. To be a Hopi. Patua was the first to spit a copious delivery of saliva into his tube. He'd studied the process. Hi, I'm Gretchen. Gretchen Cluster Baker. Do your family bake clusters? replied Patua with feigned concern. Uh, no. Duh. My ancestors maybe did, but there's no point doing that now. You'd get undercut by importers. I work in the bowling park. What are you in for? In for? I'm establishing my native heritage. Proving it, not running away from it? The employment figures for Native Americans are screwy. No, not running. I want to know who I am, said Patua with finality, as an unimpressed Gretchen drooled phlegm into her receptacle. More voices, more reasons. You're doing well, Bernie, and so are you, Tabitha. Do you want to tell everyone your reason for learning more about your heritage? Charlie asked them. Tabitha waited to see if Bernie would answer, and spoke up when he didn't. It's going to tell me if Dad is really Dad. It will do that. But are you sure you want to know? Tabitha went quiet, but it was too late, as she'd already spat and couldn't get a refund. Bernie? It's for medical reasons. An inherited condition. If you have markers from both parents. For? He really, really shouldn't ask. I can't eat chilies. A laugh breaks the group's reserve. Lucas, how about you? The usual. Which part of Africa? Lucas leans back in his seat, cross-armed, defensive. Gretchen? Which part of Venus? She's funny, thinks Charlie. The practical joke will be so much harder to go through now because he likes them all. Such good kids. What the hey, comedy must be performed or this town would get boring. Two weeks later and floors five, three, two and one were in uproar. Oh shit, oh shit! Oh. Is that you, CEO Willis? Are you locked in the washroom? Oh shit, oh shit, screw it, crap dogs! Have you got a dog in there? Is it scratching you? Who is that? Rebounded the most senior voice in the company. Tina Heller Minchkin, sir. If there's a personal injury in the cubicle, I can be very discreet handling it. I've got cold cream in my bag and might even have some treats. What? non atcg DNA? That's the damn problem. It's FJVR. Sir, they're not even nitrogenous bases. I can assure you, there's no such thing as FJVR DNA. Not on this planet, hell of a minchkin. Back in the olden days, long before the internet, when golfers couldn't stop their trousers flapping, a visionary by the name of Carl Sagan received a letter from a provocateur who claimed to have come from another planet and offered to satisfy any test that would evidence it. In reply, Sagan asked to see non-ACTG DNA. All animals and plants on planet Earth are coded from the bases adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, which abruptly ended the correspondence as Locus at the social club would tell you. The thing is, all Earth life has a common ancestor. In addition, all Earthling animals share the same body design of one head at the top, or front if on all fours, a central spinal axis, a symmetrical rib cage, four limbs and smaller bones at the end of those. To determine a non-terrestrial animal, you only have to look for a completely different design than the rib cage, head and limb pattern we would be expecting because that's all we know from Earth. 
Of course, if aliens could mimic our bodies, print new ones, or decant themselves into a mold, we would be stymied for visual identification, but DNA made from a different set of chemical markers would be decisive. That's what Sagan asked for, back to the lab, and a flustered technician's meeting. It arrived in a batch from a small town called Trentsville in Kansas. The only thing I could find online is it was founded by someone called Trent when his wagon broke down and he had to stay there and then someone else's wagon broke down and they kind of got acquainted and the police grew on them. Contamination? There's no sign of that. Or rather, I don't think it is possible. Not by a state actor to discredit us? Not even then. It would be the greatest achievement in scientific history to make a working genome from different chemical bonds and bases. It doesn't even curve clockwise. Probability theory rules this biology must have evolved independently. Is there a legal requirement to inform the capital? If you do, sir, we will need enough time to relabel the core samples in the lower lab before they confiscate everything. Authorized. That's relabel, remember? Not lose. The CEO passed into a state of soulful reflection. We will never get any more Bowie, Jeff. When you live in a small town in the middle of nowhere in particular, and the lazy days of summer don't contain quite the fireworks you'd expected, the sing-song sameness of it all can begin to pour. Watch with me now as Lucas appears in the distance, walking home, pottering along the edge of the wheat field he goes, listening to the natural insect drone of the summer. Not for him, headphones. They give him a rash. Hey, Lucas, what did you do? And there's Gretchen, leaning out of the window of her parents' car as it passes. Huh? Gretchen points enthusiastically at a parked black car as she whizzes past it. It's the feds! Run, Lucas, run! (laughs) Get lost! He shouts back at her receding bumper, then wonders to himself. Why am I such a magnet for idiots? Taking account of his situation, Lucas registers three parked cars, not one. Knowing in his logical mind he's done nothing wrong, Lucas still feels a minor blink of universal anxiety that he doesn't want to be set up for anything he hasn't. The synchronized opening of car doors tips the balance. Tense, daunted by the attention of strangers, Lucas hurls pell-mell across the field, crunching the baked earth beneath him, and then pulls up short. There are now six cars around the field, and a van with lines or bars across the back window. WTF? What do we know about the supposed family? Asks a pair of dark glasses. There's not much in central records, sir. They've kept a low profile, paid their taxes on time, a couple of traffic violations, and his father unsuccessfully applied to copyright the term electric boogaloo in 1981. I knew there was something un-American about that dance. Should I bring him down, sir, with the tranquilizer? No, put that thing back in the vehicle. We don't know what it could do to his physiology. We'll walk toward him slowly, showing him open hands. Excuse me, why are you doing that weird waving thing? That's not the protocol, sir. The protocol, dumbass, was written for humans. Fourteen days. That's how long the Federal Biohazard Investigation Team and several shifts of staff from the Bureau detained Lucas. Fourteen days of questioning, sleep deprivation, and good cop, bad cop needling. The first thirteen days had impressed them. How well this species played their part, and appeared, to the casual onlooker, to be completely human. How they never broke or changed their story. How they got the dialect and cultural references spot on, even when thrashing underwater, or when subjected to invasive cavity probing. In short, despite a few knocks to hurry things along, Lucas's head did not crack open, and, disappointingly for the federal team, no wiggly tentacles or razor-sharp teeth came out. Yes, they concluded, this was either awesome resolve or exceptional mimicry through superb training. So they did it to the squealing Gretchen too, for good measure, because she'd warned him. They sent a tickly robot millipede up her nose. Bernie and Tabitha checked out, and Patchwa had recently moved to a penthouse on a reserve, which was out of their mandate, untouchable. So every possible accomplice who'd supplied a DNA sample to that lab had now been eliminated. Toward the back end of 14 days, someone eventually thought to retest Lucas. The new test says he's 100% human. What? 
Oh my god, some bastard mixed the samples up. The agent raged, struggling to accept that any species could have hoodwinked this whole operation. Those kids are going to sue us. I think they will do that, sir. What about the electric boogaloo? Human origin, sir. The president's office checked with Chaka Khan. When Lucas is finally loaded with apologies and allowed to go home on a federally confiscated Greyhound bus, he limps resentfully back from the Trentsville stop and along a field side margin that would never again be the same. Charlie, a former Lentwetter social club and library volunteer, sits far away on the distant scrub with another of his kind alongside him. Your infiltration went well. Of course. I entered the business by cloning a new employee's brain. Isn't that dangerous? When we probe famous politicians' brains, doesn't it always cause enormous damage to their intelligence? You may have a point, but the public never notice. See what they did? Those monsters. Yes, that is how they would treat us, but worse, so we cannot reveal ourselves to them yet. Humans are not dignified or mature enough a species, so who knows how they will behave when they are introduced to the people of Plurp. Agreed. We can see if their maturity has changed after our 21 years each way round trip home. You will stay here, but you must be unnoticed. I understand. I think I've always known that they're an odd race, but the experiment had to be attempted. The chance to show their worth had to be given. We will do something for the poor boy who was hurt by these fools, but it cannot jeopardize our incremental alignment with their culture. Yes, alignment is the way to lessen the shock they will experience. Every year, the humans make continual improvements. I've been reading about 1984, and it's so much better now. I think I even prefer their language to ours now. I feel strangely self-conscious when I have to revert back to all that clicking and whistling through the ventral and rectal ducts. Anything else? I like dancing very much. You have no idea yet how difficult it is to synchronize movement on two legs with handfuls of toes getting in the way all the time and simultaneously holding the bladder and breathing in and out. When you get those things the wrong way around, it can be devastating. Noted. I find it pleasant here, when they let you alone. Ice cream is, of course, poisonous, and that simulacrum of EDs, which they call swans, have no antennae or larval stages, and they're the wrong way up. I like banjo music very much, but not drums, because they hurt me. There's one song called Lucky Boy by an Aidan Grange. That's very good. I hope he gets some luck. Have you seen those powerful trees called oaks? They have such magnificent shapes and can really hold the soil, which is a boon in case of gravity inversion. I also like ocean sunlight zones, the top thirty feet, and reading novels by unusual minds. Have you ever seen an octopus in a bottle with one big eye against the glass? I'll never tire of that, so like our entertainers, or when the humans engage in a full-blown Twitter spat. Remarkable language. Economy of emotion. Jokes are more difficult. I'm writing a thesis on them. I still can't get my mind around puns, and suspect they might be the high point of human culture. In England, they have a place called Wareham Down, and they tell me that's not a pun, but it's funnier than most jokes I've recorded. Noted. We will monitor and relocate the settlements off-world if it is a hindrance. You can also tell those poddling, printing body vessels for us, back on the mothership, that they just can't pour ourselves into a shape without first checking the literature of internal anatomy. I mean, why is my brain between my legs? Respected literature by one Virginia Woolf clearly states that this location is the origin of male thinking. Tell them not to believe the first source they find on the internet, then. Incidentally, livers aren't supposed to broadcast anything. That's not their function at all. Not even your allergies? No, nothing. And ribs are supposed to be connected at both ends. Otherwise, when you take three good breaths, you inflate like a puffer fish, and everyone runs away from you. Except kittens. Expansion fascinates kittens for some reason. You have gone native, my daploid pod sibling. I suppose I must have. 
at a tidy office block in the leafy business district of a city comfortably far away, photons stream from the sky, and an inexplicable hole the diameter of a pencil burns, pierces, and pushes through the roof, floors, concrete, and girders of a building occupied only by a defenseless genetic heritage testing company. With elegant point-to-point -point accuracy, the spear light flickers out, and a luminous, runny tinkle of plasma which follows it inside vaporizes one lap.